Hello, I'm Beck Tench, and this is a talk that I'm going to give called Swimming with Sharks. I'm going to give it on Friday at this event called Paradoxes. There's going to be a whole bunch of people, more people than I've ever spoke to in front of, um, and uh, I need to practice. And I thought, well, what a better way to practice than to record myself and share on the website, uh, because uh, many of you who will see it on the website can't be at the talk, even though I'm already terrified because it's going to be like a thousand people there. So, uh, Swim with Sharks is the story of what happened whenever I decided to work at the Museum of Life and Science. Picture of it right there. The Museum of Life and Science was given a grant uh, about six years ago um, that was, was simply to, to ask the question, what happens when we hire someone we normally wouldn't hire to do something we normally wouldn't do? Let's study the results. And I was the very lucky person that got hired to figure out what would happen. The thing that I was doing was taking risks, specifically taking risks with technology, and uh, the museum was studying what happened as a result to the culture of the place. And so, Swimming with Sharks, this talk, is a story of what happened, or at least what I learned from what happened. Uh, but before I really tell that story, it's only fair to give you a warning. Uh, and that warning is that there are sharky waters ahead. Specifically, there's the shark of, I don't know what I'm doing. And the shark of, I'm not creative or insightful enough. Or, the very real, if I fail, I'll be ridiculed shark. I know these sharks really well because I feel them right now. I certainly feel them on Friday. And I feel them every day. I feel these sharks as I try to do things that have never been done. And I even feel them when I'm trying to do things I've done before. Um, but what I want you to know, as, as I share the things that I've learned, and as you consider maybe branching out and doing some things on your own that uh, may be risk-taking, maybe failure-prone, um, that it's been my experience every last time that I'm the one wearing the shark suit. It's me, all along, that is afraid, um, but the spears aren't real, um, and the sharks aren't real. So. As I talk about this stuff and I tell this story, don't forget this little guy. I'm going to leave him up here um, because so far, so good every time it's been me. And it may probably, I'm guessing, it's you too. So, first day on the job, January 8th, 2008, I was told, if you don't fail, we'll be disappointed in you. Even remembering that, I have this moment of anxiety that bubbles up. I don't know about you, I felt completely in the dark. I've never been told to fail. Have you ever been told that not only is failure okay, but that's the point of why you're there? Um, I didn't even know what to do. Like, I have my pencils lined up and my papers all neat and, like, totally what I do on the first day of a job and, like, not even a clue how to start. I didn't know how to start. Um, because it was a place that was about science. I didn't know anything about science. I didn't know how to start because it was a museum. I'm totally, I'm still not a museum person. Um, and I didn't know how to start because I, uh, I don't, I don't know, I don't feel like I, I fail on purpose ever. But then I remembered something. I remembered that I had made a lot of change in my life and I had felt a lot trying it. This is a picture of me when I was 21 years old, so my birthday was exactly 13 years ago. And I weighed over 300 pounds. And I changed my lifestyle. I changed how I lived. And I failed hundreds if not thousands of times doing that. And I persisted and I kept going and I kept changing and I made a huge change. And I realized early on in my museum career that uh, if I needed to fail, there were probably some things that this version of me learned that would help me in uh, what I was trying to do next. And that turned out to be the case. So, I'm going to share seven things that I learned back then and also at the museum. Translate personal change to career change and hopefully inspire you to do the same. So the first thing that I learned helped me back then and helps me now is live like of fill in the blank and you'll be one. Back then, my mantra was, if I live like a healthy person, I'll be one. Lo and behold, 
After years of pretending to be a healthy person, I was a healthy person. Well, this goes for anything. It goes for absolutely anything. If you want to be a risk taker, live like a risk taker. If you want to be an innovator, live like an innovator. Read the things that innovators will read. Think and practice the way that innovators practice. Um, anything you want to be, if you pretend that you're already that thing, after some time passes, you will wake up one day and realize that you are that thing. Hugely powerful. Second thing I learned is small things over time equal big things. So whenever I was um, first, first just that, 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 that picture of me, I already threw it on the floor, that picture of me back then, the very first thing that that person did was she drank more water for a week. That's all she did. She ate all the same things and I just drank more water every day. And at the end of that, I saw some, some results. And the results were I lost a little bit of weight. And so then the next week I continued to drink more water and I ate a better breakfast. And the next week a better lunch. And those small little changes, those small decisions, they happen still every day. Every day I make these small little choices. And those small choices over 13 years equal really big, big change. And same thing goes for the projects at the museum and the projects that I work with other places on too. Whenever you can take something and distill it into something small and experimentable and failable, then, and do that thing over and over again, it can become something really important and big. Uh, we used to draw up a pen hook every Friday night, just little scribbles on my notepad. And that has turned into very large, important, mission-driven projects that the museum is doing. It's sketching becomes a way to slow down and notice the world. It is, uh, it is true in all things that if you do something small over and over again, it will become something big. Next thing. I realize this courage is a companion for fear. That fear in and of itself is not a reason to not do something. Um, just because you feel afraid, if you're going to be trying hard things, you're going to feel afraid. This is the point. But what will happen is that courage will join that fear. The fear doesn't go away. So don't use the fact that you're afraid to stop you. Use the fact that you're afraid to invite courage to participate too. Hugely important. Treat failure like a scientist. Like I said, whenever I started working at the Science Museum, I didn't know anything about science. I know science up and down now. Science is so beautiful. It is slowing down and paying attention to the world, accepting what you find. When a scientist does an experiment and this experiment fails, that failure is not a failure of science. It's not a failure of that scientist. It is data. It is something that they use to do the next thing. And any time I fail, I do my very best, and sometimes it is hard, but I do my very best to take that failure, remove it from my identity, and use it as data to do the next thing. Super powerful. If it gives you pause, pause. My risk management strategy is to use common sense, and if it gives me pause, pause. Talk to somebody about it. This allows me to take calculated risks, to be strategic about things, but to not stop because I feel a little bit of pause. It allows me to pause but keep going instead of stop because I'm afraid. Risk taking requires space making. I was given this incredible opportunity to have space to take risks at a science museum. And not everybody has that opportunity, but we all have choices we can make about how we spend our time. And whenever you're trying to do new things, whenever you're trying to make change, you need space to do that thing. So carving out space in the time of your mornings and your afternoons and your evenings, whatever energy patterns you have that make that, that space productive, create space and then don't expect things from it. One of the most beautiful things about the work that I've done at the museum is that I was in a situation where I could take time and not need to show results right away. And what we realized was that whenever you do that, the results do come, but you have to trust that time doesn't have to have a purpose immediately. So do that with your own time. Create space for yourself to be creative or create space for yourself to be contemplative or whatever it is. You need space in order to take risks. I'm sharing that with you to create space for you. Next one, my very favorite, creative practice is a safe space. I forgot it. It's my very favorite. It's my very favorite because 
Something like a bar napkin can become a safe space for you to take a risk. And it's all important for us to practice what it feels like to take a risk. Because when we practice what it feels like to take a risk and we fail, we practice failure and we practice forgiveness and we realize that it's just a shark suit and we're all okay. So I think that in, in, the, in the whole world, you can look all around you, you can look around you right now and see canvas, blank sheets of paper, space around us that we can dance and sing in. There's all sorts of canvas available to us and filling it is a way to practice risk taking really, really, really safely. And I think that if you don't have a creative practice, get one. And if you do have a creative practice, commit to it because it is so powerful to practice failure, which is inevitable whenever you try to create something. And it helps us understand it and feel okay with it and take risks elsewhere. And then the very last thing, it's in our nature as humans to forget. And everything I just said, you're going to forget because <laughs> I'm the one who said it and I forget it regularly. But if you remember anything at all, remember this last one. This is super important. You're always ever only one choice away from making your life what you want it to be. Thank you. Just a little side note on that last one since I sort of like ended it a bit prematurely, didn't say much about what I meant. Um, when I say this, yeah, when I say that what I mean is that uh, there were all sorts of things that added up to where I was on February 3rd, 2003, when I decided to try to drink my water for a week. All sorts of decisions, all sorts of complications. Um, and if I were to try to go back and untangle that and um, sort it out and then proceed, I would never have made any decision at all. I would have never tried anything. Um, the present moment is a moment that has never existed. And we get to do whatever we want to with it. And that is what's so beautiful about time and about like being alive. And so what I'm trying to say is that when I made that decision to drink more water was not monumental in the moment. It was just a decision. And you can't know whenever you're deciding something where it's going to lead. But I can tell you this and you can know this, that so much of all the crap in the past doesn't have to have any sort of resolution in order to prove, to go forward in the future. You can you can just decide. You can make a choice and just say, "All right, I'm going to do this thing now and do that thing." I promise you you can. And if you don't believe me, try it. So anyway, just wanted to make sure that came across. That's it.